Amen, amen. Y'all let them know how much you appreciate them leading us in worship this morning. And, you know, we are glad to be back. We were in Africa all week. So uh, Friday night is when we got back in. Had an awesome, awesome week, though. Took a medical team with us. They saw over 600 patients in three and a half days. That's a lot. Say amen. And uh, also had the opportunity to train pastors. And so we did that, starting a new training school in Uganda uh, we taught them two major uh, books that are in a series of books that I've used overseas. We taught them uh, biblical interpretation and rules of Bible study. And then we also taught them Old Testament survey. So we literally went through every single Old Testament book uh, in the Bible. And so uh, today I was just going to read the whole Old Testament to you, all right? And uh, I'm just kidding, but it was a great, great time. And uh, more importantly than that, we not only had the opportunity to minister people's physical needs and minister to the pastors, but the spiritual needs were met as well. Our team saw uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 uh, new converts to Christ. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? And uh, excited about that. And I know our Mexico team arrived yesterday. I have not heard word from them yet. They are probably all crashing this morning uh, where I probably should be. So if I fall asleep during this sermon, uh, you feel free to come up and wake me up or just take the notes and you preach the rest of it. Y'all with me on that one? And uh, jet lag for me is typically uh, the second day I get back home uh, from a trip like that. So today is the second day. I wasn't planning that very well. All right, so anyway, we're going to start off. We're studying Paul's letter today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 11 through 21. And start off a little bit different today. I want to give you one word to consider, and it is the word loyalty. Now, whenever you think of loyalty, and I think of loyalty, we really see this as a valuable attribute to have in your life. And really what we're doing is we are describing someone who offers their allegiance. We're describing someone who offers their devotion. We're also describing someone who offers their honor to another. And we all enjoy loyalty. We like it. We want it. In fact, you think about a married couple, right? A husband definitely wants his wife to be loyal. A wife definitely wants her husband to be loyal as well. And then you think about even in the workplace, you love loyalty, right? You want the boss to be loyal to the employees and the boss wants the employees to be loyal to them and then you can even think in the sporting arena matter of fact you will see oftentimes that a coach will talk about the loyalty of his team and then vice versa you'll see the team will talk about the loyalty of the coach there's this genuine allegiance this genuine honor this genuine devotion in these particular relationships but here's something I want you to consider loyalty to the wrong person or loyalty to the wrong cause can create chaos. Do y'all agree with this? You think about our history, right? We know loyalty to a man by the name of Hitler caused World War II. So that was individuals who were being loyal to the wrong person and also to the wrong cause. You can also take that out of the political sphere and you can place it in the sphere of religion. Uh, There are individuals today who have loyalty towards a false god by the name of Allah. And this loyalty to the wrong person and this loyalty to the wrong cause has uh, created great chaos. In fact, we have seen many individuals who have been slain as infidels at the hands of those who are loyal to a false god named Allah. Now, we can also go to the positive side and say loyalty to the right person, loyalty to the right cause can create unity and purpose. Now, whenever we talk about loyalty this morning, what you and I really should be loyal to is the Lord Jesus Christ. So as followers of Jesus, we're called to be loyal to Him, and we're also called to be loyal to His mission. Jesus Christ has called us into a relationship with him and he has given us a mission to make disciples I forgot where we're supposed to make them. Where do we make them? Yeah, we make disciples everywhere, right? This is what you and I as followers of Jesus are called to do So as I began to study the text that we're going to look at today and I began to think about you and think about my own life I began to ask a question when I'm loyal to Jesus. What really happens? Or you could say it like this, today I want to put in front of you how Paul the Apostle's loyalty to Jesus influenced his life. And then I want to ask you towards the end of this message, is your life being influenced like this? Because if you are genuinely loyal to Jesus and his mission, you are going to discover some attributes in your life that will be similar with the attributes of Paul the Apostle. 
So that in mind, we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 through 21 as we continue this study together. Y'all ready for it? Say yes. All right, y'all stand with me in honor of God's word, if you will, today. The Bible says, verse 11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men... But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your conscience. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us. So that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. And then as you continue to look at verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. One of my favorite verses, possibly yours as well, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away, and behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Somebody say amen on that. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's bow together. Father, your word is true. And we bow our head and our hearts before the Scripture. And we trust the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts and transform us today. So, Lord Jesus, will you genuinely take your word and teach us what it really is to be loyal to you and loyal to your mission as we study this Scripture together. And we'll give you glory for it. And that's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. So you can be seated this morning. All right, so whenever I'm loyal to Jesus, what happens? That is the key question that we look at today. And I'm going to give you three answers to this question based upon the text that we have just read together. First of all... Loyalty to Jesus drives passion in serving and in sharing the gospel of Christ. In other words, if you are genuinely loyal to Jesus and genuinely loyal to his mission, you will have this inner passion, this great desire to serve others in the name of Jesus and also share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that is to say, if this is absent from your life, If there is no passion, if there is no drive, if there is no desire to serve and share the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have to look at whether or not you're genuinely being loyal to Christ and his mission. Because loyalty drives that passion. Now the Bible says it this way in verse 11. Look at it again as we go verse by verse. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. Now I bought bought for just a moment this phrase here, the fear of the Lord, describes you and I being in awe of who the Lord really is. It is this concept of reverence. It also really manifests this idea of being in a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is knowing God. And it also refers back to what Paul the Apostle has already written in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he talks about the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, knowing the fear of the Lord. In other words, knowing that one day we as believers are going to stand at the judgment seat of Jesus and we're going to give an account of how we served and how we shared. He says, knowing all of this, we persuade men. And I love this word, persuade. This is where I got the word passion from. Uh, This word persuade literally means we seek to convince others of the truth. So he's saying, knowing that we're going to stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, that is why we are seeking to convince others of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to know how this really has passion intermingled with it, you look at how this word was used in other contexts in the New Testament, in the Greek specifically. Matter of fact, whenever you look at the Gospels, you will discover the chief priest and the elders were all gathering together when Jesus 
and Barabbas were standing in front of the crowds. And the Bible says that the chief priest and the elders of the day were persuading the crowds to allow Barabbas to be set free and Jesus to be crucified. So again, that word persuade is used in the Gospels to describe how the chief priests and the elders were among the crowds. And you can imagine the passion that they had on that day. Free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Well, Paul the Apostle now has a positive passion that is leading him to persuade men to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on here and says, but we have made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your conscience. Now what Paul really is getting at is we are living authentic lives before the Lord. Uh, Our motivations are clean and pure. We really do have a desire to help you so that many of you will come to faith in Jesus and that you might be built up in your relationship with Christ. He says, God knows this, our life is made manifest. And now he's saying, we are also confident that you Corinthians will see this in our lives as well. So remember, the word hope is not the same way you and I use it today. Our hope is really having all of this doubt. But this idea of hope here is confident expectation. Now, as we continue forward in verse 12, he says, we're not commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us. In other words, we're not trying to sell you on who we are. That's what Paul's getting at. But what Paul is saying is we are trying to give you an opportunity, you and Corinth, an opportunity to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. Now, Paul the Apostle specifically is calling out the Judaizers of this day. The Judaizers were those false teachers who had entered into the Corinthian church and they began to try to convince all of the Gentiles that if they really want to follow the God of Israel, they must become Jews. They must be circumcised and they must adhere to the Mosaic law. And so these who showed up took great pride in their appearance. They took pride in their circumcision. They took pride in their obedience to the Mosaic law. Paul the Apostle says, but we are not taking pride in appearance. But in fact, there is a heart change that has happened to us. And so what Paul the Apostle is elevating here are not external rules that would cause pride to come into the lives of individuals. But instead, what he is saying is we want you to be proud of us, not because we follow some rules, but because of the change that the Holy Spirit has made in our hearts. And the Spirit of God is the one who has empowered them now to love properly, to love literally the Lord rightly and love others rightly as well. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 13, he says, If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Now, I bought bought for just a moment. This word beside ourselves is pretty unique in the Greek New Testament because this particular phrase actually means if we look like we have lost our mind, If we look crazy to you, it is for God. Now, what kind of statement is this? Well, the statement that Paul the Apostle is bringing to the forefront of our attention is the fact that he may look crazy as he is seeking to minister on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ to others. And indeed, it does seem crazy that a man named Paul would enter into a city where there would be a riot And his life would be at stake for preaching the message of Christ. Why would you enter into a city where such danger is right around the corner? Or you could even look at Acts chapter 19 where Paul the Apostle was stoned as a result of preaching the message of Jesus. And he was left dead. And he left that city. But in Acts chapter 19, he went right back into the same city to preach the gospel again. This man is crazy. And what Paul says, if we look outwardly like we are crazy, it's because we are a little bit. But we are doing it all for God. And I always think about this in light of missionaries today, in light of pastors today, in light of other ministers today who are entering into dangerous territory in order to share the message of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we look at them, even as believers, and we say, those people have lost their minds. They are crazy. It's because they are doing what God has called them to do. If we are of sound mind, 
He mentions here it is for you. But I need to give you this statement right quick. This is awesome. Only a person loyal to Jesus would show so little regard for himself. And what Paul the Apostle is getting at here is be proud of us. We are willing to put our lives on the line for this message. We are willing because of the change that Jesus has made in our lives and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When you look at others who are following Christ with great passion and you think, do they, do they not think about their own lives? Do they not think about the dangers? Do they not think about, you know, where their next meal is going to come from? Do they not think about how they're going to receive finances in doing this kind of ministry? So little regard for himself it is because he was so loyal to Jesus. And there are people like this today as well. And I pray that for us as followers of Christ today, you and me, Somehow or another, we would show little regard for ourselves because of our loyalty to Jesus. We would not be so concerned what others thought about us when we shared the message of Jesus Christ where we worked. That we would not be so concerned about what others may think of us when we knock on their door in our neighborhoods and we share the message of Jesus Christ with them. That we would not be so concerned about what maybe some family members would think if we went on a foreign mission trip or went on a, into the foreign mission field to share the message of Christ and the love of Christ and not be so concerned with what may happen to us. And this is loyalty to Jesus at its finest. If we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're of a sound mind, it is for you. He's giving a contrast here. If we look crazy to the to men, it's because we're doing what God's called us to do. But if we look like we have a sound mind, it is for you. He's talking specifically to the Corinthian church. And what he's getting at here is he's saying, listen, there are times when you listen to me preach, Paul would say, and I sit down and share with you, and I'm an intellectual teacher, and he even describes himself as a father overseeing his own children. When you see that in me, it is because I am seeking to minister to you. Love this text of Scripture. And this is what drives him. For the love of Christ controls us. Now think about this, right? The love of Christ. That which has been poured out in his heart is the love of Jesus. And Romans chapter 5 says that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit of God is empowering Paul to love. The love of Christ now is controlling him. He is looking at his world completely differently. He's willing to love anybody, not just Jewish people. He's willing to love Gentiles. He's even willing to love Corinthians. And those in Corinth, by the way, were known for having really a lifestyle of great degradation. And yet Paul the Apostle went right in because he was controlled by the love of Jesus. And when you are controlled by the love of Jesus, and when I am controlled by the love of Jesus, we will serve anyone at any time, anywhere. And when we are controlled by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will share the gospel with anyone, anywhere, at any time. It's because Jesus has poured his love out into our hearts by the Spirit. Then he goes on and says, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. He's pointing to the death of Jesus Christ. And when he says, therefore all have died, he is really bringing to the forefront this idea that when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you die yourself. You die to your desires, die to your dreams, die to what you really want to do in this life. And instead, you are driven now with this selfless attitude. And that's what Paul lived with the same selfless abandon as the Lord. Christ's love which converted him now compels him. And I love that word compels. Like Paul gets up in the morning and he has to serve Jesus. Paul gets up in the morning, he's got to share Jesus. He is compelled by what God has done in his life. I fear many of us are just not that compelled by what Jesus has done for us. Which is why we don't serve, which is why we don't share. Are y'all listening? Say yes. This is huge, man. 
Going further, verse 15, he died for all. Now here's, here's the key. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now, all of this is describing a great passion that Paul the Apostle had in his life. So whenever I'm loyal to Jesus, what happens? Loyalty to Jesus drives passion in serving and in sharing Jesus. And we see that in the life of Paul the Apostle. We also see that in the life of those who were with Paul doing ministry. Second truth is this. Loyalty to Jesus destroys cultural barriers. Now, I've never seen it like this before uh, when I was working on this particular message. But it is tremendous. Matter of fact, uh, I just got to share it with you. So let let me read the text. Therefore, verse 16. From now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Now, eyeball to eyeball for just a moment. What is Paul the Apostle saying here? We recognize no one according to the flesh. What does that even mean? Well, Paul is saying, before we came to faith in Jesus, we used to recognize people according to their cultural background. We recognize Jews as people like us. We recognize Gentiles, those from other nations, as people that we should avoid because they may make us unclean. And Paul the Apostle says, we don't do that anymore. We don't recognize individuals as Jews or Gentiles. We don't recognize people as Jewish people or those from different nations. In other words, the cultural barriers have been removed. And then he goes on and says, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh... Now, about about what is he saying here? Paul the Apostle is actually saying, even though we knew Jesus as a Jewish man. Are y'all following, say yes? Because this is going somewhere unbelievable. He says, even though we have known Jesus according to the flesh as a Jewish man, yet now we know him in this way no longer. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, when we look at Jesus now, we don't see him as a Jewish man. We see him as a savior for the entire world. It's a radical shift in thinking. Now notice this verse. We quote it so often. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, keep in mind, this is coming right off of what Paul the Apostle said about Jesus. We saw him as a Jew, but we don't see him that way any longer. We used to judge people according to the cultural background of their lives, but we don't do that anymore because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. It literally means you are a brand new person. And whenever you're looking at this idea, and whenever he's saying you're a new creature, he's saying when you come to faith in Jesus, your cultural background disappears. It's no longer whether or not you're a Jew or a Gentile. It's no longer whether or not you are a black person or a white person or a Hispanic person or an African American. It's no longer any of those things because you are a new creature. It says the old things have gone away. What old things? Well, the old way of judging people, for one. The old way of looking at other people's lives and judging them based upon their cultural background. All of those things have passed away. Paul says we don't look at people like that anymore. Behold, all things new have come. Paul the Apostle writes in Galatians, There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying God has so changed you that you're a brand new person. You're a brand new creature. And we don't even identify you now as a Jew or a Greek, a slave or a free, a male or a female, but we are all one in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is as if the Lord has created a brand new race. I know that sounds odd, but here's what Peter says. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Notice this, because Peter is writing, you're a chosen race, not just to Jewish people, but also to Gentile people. 
He's saying God has done something so brand new, it's like you are an entirely different race now. You are a holy nation. You are a priesthood. Literally meaning you represent God to man as priest in the body of Jesus Christ. And you have direct access into the throne room of God as a priest would in the Old Testament because of Jesus. And this is what God has created this new people to do. That they may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has brought them out of darkness and into the marvelous light. This is why you're a part of this new family of God. So that you would tell others how they can get in the family. So if we're not doing this, then we have to question whether or not we're actually in the family. Or whether or not we're actually loyal to Jesus. Are y'all listening? Jesus didn't come to make us Jew. He came to make us completely new. And Paul the Apostle is saying, listen, the cultural boundaries that used to separate Jews and Gentiles, that which we used to live by, that which we used to judge others by, it is completely gone because in Jesus we are brand new people. That means we will serve and share anyone, anywhere, at any time, regardless of their cultural background. You know what that means? That means there is zero room for racism in the body of Christ. None. So if you kind of lean towards that direction and you've got a select group of people out there that you say, oh, we should stay away from them. You know those people, man. And you, you have these racial inclinations. You need to repent before Jesus because that is sin. And God does not love sin. That's why he's bringing the people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation that every tribe and every tongue and every nation that had been brought by Jesus through faith in him will be at the throne of God giving him glory. And when this occurs, we won't be separating ourselves in glory. You know, all the white people over here, all the African Americans over here, all the Hispanics stand on this side. No, no, no. We will come together as one because we are new creatures. Golly. I ought to go to Africa every week. Now, all these things, verse 18, are from God, meaning all this salvation which we have received, who reconciled us to himself, through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice this phrase here, reconciled us to himself through Christ. It was God who reconciled us to himself. You did not reconcile yourself to God. God reconciled you to himself. That means he made you right before him. That's literally what it means. He made you right before him. How did he do that? Through Jesus. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, he was resurrected. And then notice this, and he has given us, are y'all looking at this text? The ministry of reconciliation. He gave it to us. In other words, Jesus brought us into the family, Paul says, and then he laid at our feet. As his followers, this ministry of reconciliation, this means this service of telling others how they can be reconciled to God. But it is also not just so that we can share how people can be reconciled to God, but it is elevating how we can be reconciled to one another regardless of our cultural backgrounds. See, when you come to faith in Jesus, you're not only reconciled to God, but he empowers you to be reconciled to others as well. Namely, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling. Now notice what he says here. What does this say? Somebody say it real loud. The world. Why does Paul say this? Because the Judaizers are coming in saying to the Gentiles, if you want to follow God, you've got to become a Jew. If you want to know the God of Israel, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to live according to the Mosaic law. But then what Paul says is, no, 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 we're brand new creations, man. We are new people. And on top of all that, Christ did not come just to save Jewish people. He came to save the world. And Paul is using these words on purpose. 
saying God has brought the entire world to himself in Christ and he is not counting their trespasses against them and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation and you think about this idea of trespasses this means that the Jewish person who has stepped over the line of God's moral law and sinned which they all have because we've all sinned he says God is not counting their trespasses against him because of Jesus but then even the Gentiles who did not grow up with the Mosaic law They have committed sin by breaking the Mosaic law. And yet their trespasses are not counted against them either. All because of Jesus. And then it says here, he has committed to us. Here it is again. He's laid at our feet the word of reconciliation. When I look at this, really this idea of the word of reconciliation, you know, we could, we could look at it and say, what does he mean by the word? I think what he's doing is he's elevating just the message of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So this Word, Jesus, of reconciliation has been given to us. Are y'all listening? This has been given to us as followers of Christ. Not to sit on, not to look at and just study amongst ourselves. This has been given to us so that we can carry it to others. And if we're not doing that, for whatever reason, and Paul would say, some people are seeking not to do that because of cultural barriers. Don't you forget, man, God came to save the world. Not just Jewish people, not just Gentiles. Not just rednecks. Came to save everybody who would believe. And aren't you glad for that, by the way? Because most of you in here, y'all don't even look Jewish. Not even close. But God graciously sent His Son, Jesus, so that we might be saved. And Paul even writes in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, to be specific... Now, this is, this is what is crazy to me, right? Paul is dealing with this over and over in his ministry. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. Now, why did he have to say that? Because the Jewish people were trying to make the Gentiles Jews. He says, no, 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 they don't have to become Jews. They are fellow heirs. They are fellow members of the body of Jesus Christ. And they are fellow partakers of the promise which is in Christ through the gospel. Now, what is the promise which is in Christ? Here's the promise. I'm going to give it to you very quickly. Y'all listen and say yes. God made a promise in the book of Genesis. Through the seed of a woman, a man would come who would crush the head of Satan. To the seed of a woman was a foreshadowing of the virgin birth of Jesus. And Jesus went to the cross. Can I ask you a question? Did he defeat Satan? Yes, he did. He knocked his teeth out through the cross. And then you look at Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham that through his descendants would come one who would be a blessing. Listen to this. To all nations. There it already is. Paul the Apostle even says that God was preaching the gospel to Abraham in the Old Testament, telling him that the blessing would come to all nations. And who is the descendant who has offered the blessing to all nations? It is Jesus. And then you look at David. God made a promise to David and said, David, listen, I'm going to raise up one of your descendants, and he is going to be a king who will reign forever. And who is that king? Jesus. Out of the mouth of babes. So, we are a part of the promise even as Gentiles. And Paul is trying to say in the book of Ephesians, listen, y'all, quit trying to separate yourselves. Man, God has broken down those cultural barriers. So when I'm loyal to Jesus, it's going to have a passion for serving and sharing in my life. And when I'm loyal to Jesus, it's going to destroy cultural barriers. I will serve anybody, anywhere, anytime. I will share the gospel with anybody, anywhere, anytime. I don't care what they look like, what color their skin is, what language they speak. We have been called as followers of Jesus to share the gospel. Last one, loyalty to Jesus defines my life and I love this right it defines my life verse 20 I got to go quick here we are ambassadors for Christ ambassador y'all have heard this before right an ambassador is somebody who speaks on behalf 
of a nation to other nations. You know, whenever we travel internationally, whether you go to Mexico or you go to Poland, we had some in Poland this past week, or whether you uh, go to Cuba, whether you go to Africa, when you go to those countries, most of the time there is a U.S. embassy inside that country. Now check this out. Here's what's awesome. If I were to visit the U.S. embassy in Uganda, as soon as I step inside the U.S. embassy of Uganda, I would have been considered to be on U.S. soil. And then those who work in that embassy are considered ambassadors. So that means those in the embassy of Uganda for the United States who are ambassadors, they are speaking on behalf of the United States in Uganda. Now, picture the whole thing of what Paul's getting at. He is saying, you as a body of Christ are like an embassy on earth. And when a person comes into contact with you, it's as if they have come into contact with someone who is from a different land. It's as if they have stepped on the soil of heaven because they've come to know you. And you are an ambassador, meaning you now speak on behalf of heaven to those who are upon the earth, telling them how they can come into a relationship with God. We're ambassadors. We are, we are, we are. Every single one of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're an ambassador for Christ. And then he says, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Now think about that, right? God is begging through you. So when you come into the family of God, you're so changed. The Spirit of God empowering you now that you are begging people, pleading with them, persuading them to come into a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. And then here's the gospel. Are y'all still with me? Say yes. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is an amazing concept. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That means when Jesus went to the cross at Calvary, God laid upon him the sin of the world. The Bible says in 1 John, he died for the sins of the whole world. Now that is an amazing concept because Jesus was without sin, he was absolutely pure, he was God in the flesh, and yet God viewed his son Jesus on the cross as if he were sin, and then he poured out his wrath on him. Why did he do all this? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, so that God could look at you today, look at me today, and see us as perfectly righteous. Now that seems odd. It's like, you mean to tell me God sees me as righteous? God counts me, considers me, reckons me as absolutely righteous? How can that be? I am a sinner. We'll just flip that for a moment. How can it be that God would have reckoned Jesus to be sin when he was absolutely pure? That seems as foreign as the other. And yet God has chosen to do this. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on your behalf. Are y'all listening? He's made Jesus to be sin on my behalf. He's made Jesus to be sin on behalf of those who have not yet even come to know Christ yet so that he could make us righteous. And he, and this again, are y'all listening? Say yes. This again is all in the context of the Judaizers saying, if you want to live a righteous life, you have to obey the Mosaic law. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to adhere to all of these rules. You've got to make sure that these days are set aside, that these festivals are set aside. You don't eat that. You do eat this. You can't drink that. You can drink this. Here's what all of this stuff is so that they're, they're trying to earn righteousness. And Paul says, you can't earn it. You cannot earn it. Even in the Old Testament. When you study the Old Testament, you will discover that people were not saved by their works. They were saved by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. David believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, we must have the righteousness of Jesus 
granted to us because we cannot earn it. This is what we're called to share. This message, this message. So when I'm loyal to Jesus, and here's where I want you to look in the mirror, okay? Whenever you're loyal to Jesus, are y'all with me? When you're loyal to Jesus, here's what shows up. And the question is, is it showing up in your life? Is it showing up in my life? When I'm loyal to Jesus, it drives a passion for serving and sharing Christ. Is this true of your life? Or are you saying, you know what? I don't know. I don't, I don't really see that happening. Or if you're loyal to Jesus, it destroys cultural barriers. You're like, is that happening in my life? Or when you're loyal to Jesus, it defines your entire life. People weren't confused about who Paul was and who Paul was following. They weren't shocked to find out he was a follower of Jesus. He was loyal to him. So I guess the question for all of us is, are we really loyal to Jesus or not? Let me pray for us. Father, today we're grateful just for who you are and what you've done for us and your son Jesus. And I do pray that you will awaken our souls to this great calling that you have placed upon each one of our lives as your followers. You brought us into a brand new family. You've made us brand new creatures. You've made us ambassadors for Christ. And when we are loyal to you, you beg people through our lives to be reconciled to God. Father, help us to live in that manner. And thank you for the great example of Paul the Apostle in our scripture. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed this morning. You may be here today and you say, well, Levi... None of those things have ever described my life. Then I want to ask you, have you genuinely come to faith in Jesus? Not have you heard about him or gone to church all your life, but have you surrendered to Jesus Christ? So if you're here today and you say, you know what, Levi, I've never done that, and I want to make that right today, then right now where you are, you can just pray and Ask the Lord to come into your life. And with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, nobody looking around. If you're here today and you say, Levi, I definitely want to give my life to Jesus, then just pray something like this in your heart as I pray out loud. Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. So today I'm turning from my sin and placing my trust in you. Thank you for Jesus who died for me. And thank you for his resurrection. Help me to live a life unashamed of who he is. And help me to start today. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, nobody looking. If you're here today and you say, Levi, that's my prayer. Just gave my life to Jesus. First step of obedience is baptism. So in a moment, we'll stand to our feet. I'm going to invite you to come forward. I'll be here in the front of others as well. And if you need to be baptized, go in public with your faith. We want to help you with that. God may be calling you to join this church family. If that's the case, you'd be obedient as well. But most of all, Man, I pray that we are a loyal people to Jesus and his mission. Father, we give you the invitation this morning. Have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. And while we sing, you come if God is calling you this morning.